Hey everybody and welcome to True Crime Paranormal with the Psychic Sisters. This is Katie Weaver and I'm here with my co-anchor and partner in crime, Christy Brower. Hello. Hello. Hey everybody. How's it going? Oh, it's going so good. You know, just life. <laughs> no, it's going really well. <laughs> going going really on. well. I'm I'm adjusting still to all of my new tech and my new setup in my office. And like I just I keep moving stuff around. And I'm like, keep I just can't stop fiddling with it because it still mm -hmm. doesn't feel quite perfect to me. So mm -hmm. I, I'm kind of just making myself nuts with it, frankly. <laughs> I hear that. You know how many I have fought with lighting until it's just not even funny. And I finally have my mm -hmm. lighting just right. But if anyone walks in my office and even looks at my lighting, I will tear them mm -hmm. apart because yeah. <laughs> I, will I probably will over actually, that. But, mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. I'm you still working on lighting, so I'm glad you figured it out because I... Mm, well, I'm, me too, because I think for about the first nine months of this uh, podcast, my lighting was total shit. So We're trying to grow up, you guys. It was, it was so bad my daughter called me and said, if I have to look at your videos with that crappy lighting anymore, I'm going to stop watching. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm trying. I know it's bad. She's like, mom, figure it out. It looks terrible. That, okay. that sounds like Mateo Lynn to me. Yeah. She looked at me one time and said, I thought I told you to throw those pants away. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing a mom says to a kid, not a kid to a mom. But right. She didn't tell me. To Get it straight. Away. But I happened to like them, God forbid. Anyway, <laughs> different story for a different day. She's going to go. rule the world, so we're going to put up with it all. Right. Anyway, That's true. Well, this is my turn to present a case to Christy. You might have heard of this case, Christy. I don't know. Uh, you are better schooled in serial killers than I. However, Ooh. we have the funnest news. Oh, we do. So, my son is a college student, as you guys know, and his school does an extra little term in between. Uh, well, usually it's in between winter and spring terms, but this year it's or fall and spring terms. But this year it's at the end. So they're calling it May term. Mm -hmm. You just take one class that's three credits and it's, you know, a million hours a day for a few weeks. Anyway, he's a psychology student and he's got some focus in criminology and he's taking a serial killer's class. Woo! And he coolly told us that he'll share his course material with us so that we can take it. Ghost, we can ghost take it. We can ghost take it. I'm so excited. So excited about it. Yeah. I'm mostly excited to see, like, how many of them do I already know? Right. But, dude, how many of them are there out there I didn't know about? Because if it's serial, I know. Every time I say this, people are like, I'm like, I love serial killers. Oh, I mean, not like that. <laughs> not, not like that. I don't love, love them. I'm not like those weirdos that marry them in prison over the phone or whatever. Um, I just find them very interesting. Yes. I love and I watch a lot children. of documentaries about them. Yes. There you go. So anyway, <laughs> we're going back, back to school again. Yep. Take it, man. Woo. Yep. Now someone's going to tell me don't ever sing on the show again. But that's okay. It's fine. I can roll with All it. Right. <laughs> anyway, so we're going to have lots of things to teach you guys. I just know it. We're going to anyway. bring class to you. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's get into this guy because, holy Lord, this is going to have a few twists and turns. So try to bear with me uh, okay. because it's crazy. All right. So this dude, it's already charming, crazy. Look at that hair. Right. Ooh. This charming gentleman right here's name originally is Terry Rasmussen. Okay. Terry Rasmussen was born in Colorado in 1943. It's a very Idaho name, isn't it? Like it is, interestingly. Mm -hmm. He attended high school in Arizona, but he dropped out and joined the Navy in 1961. Okay. Lots of serial killers have ties to the military, at least early, early life. It's just weird. We've seen that so many times. It's true. And you usually know, they're ones that last like, you know, a minute in the military yeah. and that's it. You know, I have a theory as to why. Dude, because yeah. they're generally troubled and troubled men tend to be filtered toward the military because they think that all of the structure is going to straighten them out. 
It yeah. still happens now working in mental yeah. health. You'll see teenage boys filtered toward the military all the mm -hmm. time because they think it's going to fix them. Well, parents used to send their kids to the military to fix them too. Yeah. And now the military has gotten a lot more savvy to that and they don't take people for lots of reasons, but having a lot of, uh, you know, issues with crime, with mental health, things like that are reasons why they won't take you in the military. Yeah. It turns but they out they don't actually the want to rehab people, but yeah. Yeah. That used to, I think that's why a lot of serial killers ended up in the military early in their lives. Mm -hmm. I think that's a super good point. Yeah. So in the Navy, he was trained as an electrician and he served mm -hmm. for six years uh, around the West wow. Coast and Okinawa. He made it for quite a while. He did. Six years is pretty good mm -hmm. for a serial killer. Just saying. Yep. In 1968 in Hawaii, he got married and left the military and he and his wife moved to Phoenix and they had four children. And then in 1975, he and his wife separated and he, his, the wife and kids never saw him again. Totally disappeared. Just disappeared. Wow. Mm -hmm. So he was trying to be normal for a long time. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing you see a lot of serial killers that have a spouse and children. Like yeah. they're trying to fit in, they're trying to be normal, mm -hmm. trying to do the things that all of the regular people who aren't, you know, psychopaths are doing. Yeah. yeah. But they can't maintain it, you know? Yes. Yeah. So this guy's following the path pretty mm -hmm. clearly here. Truly. So his wife, ex-wife says that the last time she saw him was sometime between 1975, 1976. Okay. So fast forward to 1978. And in 1978, he meets this girl. Mm. And her name is Marlise Honeychurch. In, and now he's in California. This is in La Puente, California. Okay. And she shows up at Thanksgiving with this guy who identifies himself as Terry Rasmussen. And she has two little girls, a six-year-old and 11-month-old. Oh, yikes. Marie and Sarah. And she and her mother get into an argument. I had always wondered if it was about Terry, mm -hmm. but I don't know that. But they got into an argument and they leave. And they never see her again. She yikes. just vanishes. And for years, her family searches and searches and searches. They don't know what happened mm -hmm. to her or to those little girls. And, you know, they law enforcement is like, well, I mean, she's an adult and she left with her kids and, you know. So they don't like do look that. at him. Maybe he did something. What's that? They don't suspect him at the time. If they do, they don't do anything. There's just nothing okay. really happens. Her family continues for years trying to open up another investigation or get some help. And they just don't, they don't really get anything. Wow. So in 1979, this was in 1978 in 1979, Terry Rasmussen is working in as an electrician in Manchester, New Hampshire. So now he's back there to the other side of the country in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he's going by the name of Bob Evans. But later on, uh, when his uh, story becomes more known, this guy says, oh, hey, he was working for me and his name was Bob Evans. Well, they're both such like um, innocuous white name. guy names. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cracks me up. OK. But, you know, you could, he, yeah. he would blend in pretty easily with those names. Mm hmm. So he's just working, as far as we know, as an electrician for a few years mm -hmm. uh, in New Hampshire. In 1981, in New Hampshire, Denise Bowden, 23-year-old single mama, and her six-month-old daughter, Dawn, and her boyfriend, a guy by the name of Bob Evans, oh boy, pack up and leave New Hampshire together. This is her. Okay. And so this is uh, Denise. This is in 1981, shortly after Thanksgiving, interestingly. Mm. 
Not the first time a woman took off with him right after Thanksgiving, which is odd. Mm -hmm. So her family never hears from her or sees her again. Mm -hmm. And they don't know. They think he took off, she took off with him. Like that was, that was communicated. Yeah. They moved. They said they moved. Okay. Yeah. They were moving to another state. Yeah. Yeah, they were moving to another state. She told her family that he owed a lot of people money and he needed to move to another state and get a fresh start. Oh, yikes. Yeah. So that's what they did. So now we realize these things are happening in different states. There's no real media coverage happening. There's no internet. No one is making any connection between any of these cases whatsoever. And they're mm-hmm. happening from one side of the country to the other. Yeah. So many times that's the thing that keeps a serial killer from getting caught is just changing places. Yes. So I've got to upload more uh, more pictures. This case, I told Christy, this is going to take a lot of media <laughs> to cover it all. Mm-hmm. Okay. So then, all right, so that was in 1981, right? Mm -hmm. So fast forward now to 1985, and a man named Curtis (laughs) Kimball is arrested. Are you kidding me? (laughs) Like, is there a guide for generic white guy names? Because Terry had it figured out. He really did. Yeah. He could have fit right in in Utah and no one would have ever found him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Curtis Kimball is arrested for drunk driving in Orange mm. County, California. Oh. Okay. So it's 1985. So it's four years now since uh, Denise Bowden took off with him. Mm-hmm. And so Denise and her baby. And her six-month-old baby. Okay. So he gets arrested for drunk driving, and he has a child in the car who he identifies as Lisa. Mm. And he's actually charged with endangering the welfare of a child. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, because he's drunk driving with a little girl in the car. Right. And again, he says his name is Curtis Kimball, which, you know isn't his name but right and he okay so that's the next time he's on the radar Mm -hmm. on november 10th of that year there is a guy who is hunting back in new hampshire you guys are Mm going to have whiplash by the time this is over and i'm i apologize i'm going to do my best he comes (laughs) across this Mm. Now, I'm going to tell you guys something. Hunters in Idaho, when they're Mm. hunting for bears, they take a barrel like this and they put a calf or some other kind of uh, livestock, dead livestock in it. Yeah. And they let it sit for like six months to get nice and horrific. And then they will take them and put them under bear stands and wait for bears to come in. That's what that looks like to me. Chumming the bears. Yeah. Yes. But a hunter finds this. um, He calls the police. This has a woman and a six-year-old little girl er, stuffed inside of it. God. And they don't know. They have no idea who this person is. Right. No. They have no idea. And so... They, uh, you know, obviously the police start an investigation and they start looking into what the, uh, you know, who these people, who this mom or who this woman and this child could be. So that's in November of 1985. In January of 1986, Gordon Jensen. Oh, my gosh. Is living in, yeah, is living in. Uh, I, I swear to you, like I've actually known people with all of these names. Right. It's so right? weird. He's living in Santa Cruz County. He's working as a handyman at an RV park. 
And he Mm. has a five-year-old little girl with him that he calls Lisa. And he tells people she's his daughter. They don't really have any reason to think she's not, right? Mm -hmm. So, but who is this little girl? He's there for a while, for, for six months or so. And he meets some people who really kind of fall in love with little Lisa and she's, they babysit for him. And, you know, they, they really, they're kind of like surrogate grandparents to her. Mm -hmm. And he tells them that he wants to put her up for adoption, but it's just too hard to be a single dad. And he, he just needs to put her up for adoption. And so they say, well, our daughter will adopt her. We'll we'll Mm -hmm. take her into our family. Our daughter will adopt her. So they're kind of in the process of trying to make this happen. And he's telling them that he's going to bring them adoption papers to sign to have this done. Mm -hmm. And then Gordon Jensen vanishes. So these people call the police because they wanted to adopt her. They have her. He leaves her with them. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't sign any paperwork and they don't know what to do. So they call the police and the police, unfortunately, this is very sad to me. They take her and they put her in foster care. Right. Which I don't understand because these people wanted her. Legally, they would have to until they worked it out. Yeah, I guess so. So they issue an arrest warrant for Gordon Jensen for child abandonment. And... They pull a fingerprint from the RV park to try to figure out who this guy is because just the stories just aren't really jelly, right? Right. And they discover that he was arrested under the name of Curtis Kimball for drunk driving. Right. So now they know that Gordon Jensen and Curtis Kimball are the same people. Same people. Right. Same person. Same person. So this is in 1986. Okay. In 1987, in New Hampshire, they finally bury the woman and the child that were found in the barrel. Still, they have no idea who she is. It's really sad. Mm. Uh, And I know this, it's all going to come together, guys. Don't worry. (laughs) <laughs> so then in March of 1989, so this is three years since he abandoned little Lisa, mm-hmm. he's arrested. Gordon Jensen is arrested mm. and booked for child desertion. So he pleads guilty to child abandonment. He was fighting it until the prosecutor said that she was going to ask for a paternity test. Oh, And he immediately flipped the script and said, I just want to plead guilty. I just want to plead guilty. Mm -hmm. So he pleads guilty. And he gets sentenced to a few years in prison. And he is released after about. Yeah. He actually got. I got to tell you that in Idaho, he would not have gotten prison time for that. And that is so screwed up. But he wouldn't have. Holy crap. This time. Oh, here's. Here's Curtis Kimball. I mean, he yep. looks like a garden gnome who dropped his hat. Right? Like, yeah. Whoa. Yeah. So he does about a year and a half before they let him go. Mm-hmm. So that was in 1990. He's but what does he do with the daughter? The daughter just goes into the foster care system and is, uh, is uh, adopted out. Yikes. Yeah. So that's that's little Lisa. And don't worry, we're not done with her either. <laughs> so this is now 1990. He mm-hmm. has been paroled. He does not report for a parole date in California and vanishes. Well, wow. nine years go by that are unaccounted for. Who knows how many names he goes by at this point. Right. But... In December, Probably Larry like, Jones and Steve ooh, Smith. And- <laughs> you're way too psychic. Hold on. <laughs> in, <laughs> in December of 1999, I, a chemist named Yus, 
sorry, Yun Sun, Yun, Yun Soon Jun. Mm, shows up to a party with her colleagues, this beautiful lady right here, mm -hmm. shows up to a party with her colleagues and introduces them to a man named Larry Banner. <laughs> oh, well, I was close. And they get married. So the mm. friends say they have a backyard wedding in June 2002. But there is no official uh, record in the state of California. So they must have just Not a had a legal marriage. Yeah, had a ceremony. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, in May of 2000, a second barrel is found in Bear Brook State Park. Oh, crap. This barrel has two children in it. One is believed to be around one years old. The other child appears to be somewhere between two and four years old. Oh, no. So just know that. Now, fast forward to 2002, shortly after the backyard wedding. Unsoon disappears. Mm. And her friends, she had a good circle of friends before Larry Banner came into the picture. Mm -hmm. And they are very concerned and they report her as missing. Mm -hmm. So in September of 2002, Larry Vanner is brought in for questioning. Gives his yeah. fingerprints voluntarily and his fingerprints come back as Curtis Kimball. Mm -hmm. And what's that other one he was using? Yeah. Yeah. So now they know, okay, this is not who we thought this was. So they realize that Curtis Kimball, of course, uh, is wanted for violating parole in abandoning baby Lisa. Mm -hmm. And so they finally, they're figuring out that they've really got a situation on their hands, right? Yeah. So they end up uh, searching the home, the home that these two lived in. I believe it was her, her home, but, you know. He moved in. Hey, of course. Hey, hey, hey. Rico. Sorry. <laughs> Got a naughty dog on my hands here. Uh-oh. Um, at any rate, uh, so they search the home. And guess what they find buried in the basement? Oh, no. Yeah. Under 10 bags of kitty litter, they find Unsoon June. Yeah. Under 10? Oh, man. Mm-hmm. Yikes. So he is formally charged in November 2002 with her murder. Mm -hmm. And he pleads guilty as Curtis Kimball. So they still think this is Curtis Kimball. They still don't know who Terry Rasmussen is, huh? They still don't know who Terry Rasmussen is. And he gets sentenced to 15 years to life in prison. 15 years to life. He freaking murdered his wife. Mm -hmm. And buried her in the basement. 15 years? Are you sure? Yeah. Anyway, so he's in prison. Now, they still don't know what they have here. Mm -hmm. In August of 2003, they finally do some DNA testing on Lisa and discover that she is not Gordon Jensen's daughter, nor is she Curtis Campbell's daughter. And in case you're wondering, she's also not Terry Rasmussen's daughter, nor Larry Vanner's daughter. Yikes. She's not the daughter of this man, this mm -hmm. weird, creepy murderer who's been dragging her around the countryside. So they reopen her case to try to figure out who she is. Yeah. So seven years go by, and Rasmussen dies in oh. a California state prison. Yikes. He has pulmonary emphysema, pneumonia, and lung cancer. Wow. So he dies. So then. I guess when you uh, kill all those lights your whole life. Yeah. I don't know. That's probably not true. But. Well. Kind of makes you feel better though. Right. So in the summer of 2016, some genealogists have gotten very involved in this case because, you know, we have some really weird stuff going on, right? Right. So 
They use genetic genealogy to figure out who Lisa is. And that's one of the breaks that, that come mm -hmm. in the case. There is a genealogist who works really hard to figure out who she is. Right. And right. Because I mean, come on, man. So they discover that through genealogical DNA, which is some of the stuff we've been talking about, you know, where they oh, yeah, start amazing. like fanning out a family tree, right? Mm -hmm. So they discover that Lisa is Dawn Bowden. It's now remember, weird. Dawn Bowden was the six month old who yeah. vanished with her mother, Denise Bowden. Right way before right so the genealogist that puts this all together is a woman named barbara ray venter okay so they track down her family and relatives tell them that uh denise moved away and was never heard from again and they've never known what happened to her or to that baby mm -hmm. so at least now lisa knows where she came from she's yeah. now married and has children of her own and has sure. her own life but she actually is re uh introduced to her family and actually gets to know her uh her mother's father a little oh, bit oh wow that's cool yep she meets her maternal grandfather it's pretty amazing yeah so but denise nobody knows Nobody knows what happened to Denise or where she went. If there are going to be more barrels found someday. I wonder. I really wondered about that. Yeah. Okay. Hold on. I'm going to grab us a little bit more media here. Well, yeah, because what about the barrels and the, does anybody ever determine who those people are and how they're connected to him? Patience. Oh. Patience, dear grasshopper. <laughs> I assumed if you mentioned them that there's some kind of resolution here. Mm -hmm. So, when the when Lisa is identified, mm -hmm. and then they finally put two and two together because this was Bob Evans, right? So right. now we're finally linking the name Bob Evans from New Hampshire to Bob Evans in California. Right, right. Okay. So they do some DNA testing. And in October of 2016, they confirm that Bob Evans is the father of the little girl in the barrel that was ages two to four. Yikes. So now they know... Now, but she was in the barrel with another child that was smaller than her, who he is not related to. So now they know at least that he was the father of one of those children. Mm -hmm. So in January of 2017, uh, sorry, I'm going to step forward. That's, mm -hmm. So in October of 2018, sorry. They announced that Bob Evans, they have linked his DNA to the victims in the barrels. So mm -hmm. now they know that he killed the victims in the barrels. Okay. And Do they know how? Do they know how they were killed? I don't think so. If they did, I didn't read that. Okay. I. Uh, so now they at least know this, that he is the one who killed them. Mm -hmm. Now, our genetic genealogist hero of this story, Barbara Ray Venter, also yeah. identifies Evans as Terry Rasmussen. Oh, wow. Because there we she go. takes a look. She's looking at his genealogical, you know, uh, family tree and yeah. finally figuring out, wait a minute. This is who this person actually is. Right. And they do that by, it's a, it's a big process. I mean, it's by looking at DNA that's been submitted, 
you know, mm-hmm. to some of the websites where it's allowed. Now that's not like 23 and me or, you know, the ones that you just submit to find out like where your family tree is from though. They do not submit your DNA. These are different sites where you've given your permission for that. Right. Right. Yeah. Cause there's a big debate about this, about whether you should be allowing your DNA or not. Yeah. And some people, you know, want that to be private. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, I guess if I haven't killed anybody, why do I need my DNA to be right. private? You know, we're seeing so many cases solved because of DNA. I'm a fan, but yeah, people are worried about freedoms and some people privacy. are afraid that like it would affect your ability to get insurance. You know, because yes. your DNA might say, "Hey, you're going to get this terrible disease" or whatever. Yeah. But now that we have abolished um, pre-existing conditions, I don't know. Mm-hmm. That that would even matter anymore. But yeah. Anyway, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So these are the things they know. So in October of 2018, a reporter by the name of Jason Moon uh, launches a seven-episode podcast about the Bear Brook case, about all of the barrels with the mm-hmm. people who we now know who the murderer is. Right. Right. So. That podcast was downloaded 11 million times. Wow. And one of the people that heard that was an amateur sleuth, a woman by the name of Rebecca Heath. Mm. And Rebecca Heath is determined to figure out who is missing this woman and these children. Right. Right. Like, this is terrible. Somebody has lost these family members. Yeah. So she, as well as the geneticist, uh, genealogist, Ray Venter, they start using a DNA profile uh, provided by new technology. This is some of the really new technology that's been being used right now to solve a bunch of cases. Mm-hmm. And betw- they are both working on it from different angles. So Ray Venter is working, you know, from the genealogical an- angle. Heath is working from the angle of just looking, you know, for all of the missing persons cases. Yeah. That would be a mother and two little girls. Yes. And about the same time, they come up with the same information. Mm. That this is indeed Marley's Honeychurch and her two little children, Marie Vaughn and Sarah McWaters. Okay. So this is... So I'm sharing a picture here. The top pictures are actual pictures of the three of them. Mm-hmm. The bottom are DNA profiles of what. Uh, wow. It, or maybe actually, I think that's not right. They're artist sketches of from their remains. Like age progressed kind of. Yeah. Yep. Wow. So wow. finally, in November of 2019, they finally can have a funeral for these three angels and Mm -hmm. family finally gets some closure. It's really sad. Her brother said that her mother blamed herself forever that she fought with her and she left and she never came back and it was her fault. And you know, what they didn't know is that they were murdered. Right. But they came from California. So he had them with him for an indeterminate amount of time, a few years, maybe, maybe not quite that long. The baby was only 11 months old. And when they found them, they figured that the littlest one was around two years old. So it might have been a year-ish that they were with him before he killed them. But then we have this mystery. Oh, come on, Tag. Hold on. It's it's not the Tag's fault. It's entirely my own. (laughs) We have the other child from the barrel who actually was his, Mm -hmm. really matched Terry Rasmussen's DNA. And we don't know who this one is. They have finally determined the county that they believe that her kin are in. And this is just recently. So this is actually a sketch that was released a year ago on February 20th, 2020, of what this little one would have looked like. She's nearly all Caucasian and has a tiny bit of Asian and Native American blood. Okay. Her family, they believe, 
comes from Mississippi. They believe that her family is in a specific county in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And that's all they know. They don't know who her mother would have been or where her mother is. So they basically just pinpointed it based on DNA mm -hmm. that she must be from this area. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Genetic DNA is telling them that she, her relatives should be in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it doesn't mean that she was necessarily born there, just that her, her, relatives. her mother's family is from yes. there. Yes. Yep. So that's all. They know. They actually know the names of who they believe her, like, five to six times great-grandparents would be, grandfathers, wow. from either Thomas Dead Horse Mitchell, born mm -hmm. in 1836, or William Livings, born in 1826. Wow. That is amazing. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. This is Pearl River County, Mississippi. Wow. And so they're asking anybody who are direct descendants of those men to contact the law enforcement to see if we can figure out who she was and yeah. who her mother was. Right. Yeah. Because either her mother is was murdered out there somewhere, which is, in my opinion, very likely. Yeah. Or he kidnapped her. Which I think is unlikely, but then again, yeah. he drugged poor little Lisa around for five years. So he did. It's, it's hard to know. So we know that, you know, we know that Denise Bowden uh, has never been seen again. And we are assuming that he murdered her somewhere. And then we know that this child, uh, he murdered her. And we don't know anything about her mother. I mean, he certainly had a penchant for single mothers. He sure did. With children. Yeah. Particularly little girls. Particularly little girls. Yeah. Ugh. Yep. I'm sure we can all put the piece, puzzle pieces together there. So that's the whole case. I mean, I like I said, so many twists and turns. So yeah. much. Uh, uh, God, it's awful. But there's a there are big time spans throughout uh, his life that we don't know anything about, and right. you know, four aliases. We know his initial name and then we know that he went by terry varner no that's not right he went by terry larry uh varner. larry varner he went by oh, i shouldn't have started because now i don't know <laughs> he went by all those weird white white guy names that's what yeah. we know you know but so we know that he went by all of these different names we don't know how many more names he might have gone by no you know it was many mm -hmm. i that feel like there's so many more victims here yeah. than yeah. have been oh, identified. Bob Evans. So we had Terry Rasmussen, Bob Evans. Yeah. And then Larry Vanner. Well, yeah. and, uh, and Curtis, Curtis Kimball. Kimball. Yeah. yeah. Those are the four we know, but it's likely, yes, that there are more. Authorities think that there are probably more aliases and there are probably many more bodies than we There know. are. I no doubt. I keep hearing the number 20, mm -hmm. that he had 20 victims. Wow. He didn't seem like a canary once he got in prison, that's for sure. You know, and that's weird. Yeah, some that's of them do. That's weird but... because most serial killers want attention. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this guy, this guy wasn't your typical serial killer, like, psychologically. Right. He was just a narcissist who used people until he was done with them and then threw them away. He wasn't motivated by killing no. the way that some serial killers are. Mm -hmm. I feel like he just, when someone was no longer useful to him, he killed them and moved on. And it, it included the children that were involved. You know, he didn't care. They served a purpose for him. And when they no longer served the purpose, and I feel like that was often because... The woman was beginning to question the relationship, question him about who he is and what's, you know, and I feel like he was very sure that he should be able to do whatever he wanted and that no one should question him. Yeah. And when any woman did, then they were no longer useful to him and 
and she and whoever of her offspring were, um, you know, eliminated. Yeah. Except for Lisa. Yeah. And I feel like he had some genuine feelings for Lisa and he didn't know why. Yep. And it freaked him out, but he could not let her go. Yep. And he knew that he had to get rid of her or he would kill her. I feel like he knew it, mm -hmm. that eventually he was going to, you know, snap and have enough of her just like he had of everybody else. And he did not want to kill her. I feel like he genuinely, in the only creepy way that he could, he had some form of love for her. Mm hmm and she loved him back. Yeah. And he wasn't used to that. He didn't expect yeah. that and wasn't used to it. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, he's he doesn't fit the norm. I mean, he sort of no. his early years kind of fit it, but I don't mm -hmm. feel like he was actually motivated I by killing. That's when it goes off the rails. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and he had a trade, you know, so wherever he went, he was a handyman, he was an electrician. He seemed to be able to make money and take care of himself. He wasn't necessarily a thief. He was, right. you know. Well, and that kind of work is pretty anonymous. Yes. You know, it's pretty anonymous mm -hmm. because you can be self-employed, mm -hmm. work for yourself and, and make enough to live on, you know. Yeah. Because that's, that's quite a skill and it's not unusual even now for electricians to just be self-employed and do their own thing, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense to me that, that he mm -hmm. could go, he could fly under the radar for this long because of that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I think it's possible that here in the next 10 years or so, we'll hear of more cases, you know, being solved mm -hmm. that uh, have his DNA written all over them. Right. Now that his DNA is out there in the system, it's they're more going to show up. I just keep hearing the number 20, yeah. that there were 20 bodies. That there were 20 murders in this situation. Between children and adult women. Yes, yes. And there were more, more single mom kinds of situations. And, you know, he kind of appealed to single women because he had a trade. He had a job. Uh -huh. He wasn't going to depend on them for money. Well, you know, he acted like he loved kids. Mm -hmm. You know, he did. I feel like he would act like he loved kids and maybe talk about how, you know, he's divorced and he has four children in Arizona and, you know, that he would not that he, you know, once he abandoned them, he was done with them. No, thank God for them. They but, were so lucky that he didn't kill them. And I think he didn't kill them because they were his. Yeah. And later on down the road, obviously that was no longer a priority for him. But um, I feel like, you know, that was sort of the, the straw that broke the camel's back. Now, when I'm done with somebody or they're done with me, that's it. They're done for real. Yeah. Well, and this is, it brings up another point. Did he go back to one of those barrels and add the, his own little child? Right. Or was she already there and he put another child in there with him? Or did right, he? The timeline is so mixed up. Picked her up and had her with them by the time he killed them. We don't know. Yeah, the right. timeline is so mixed up. So we don't know how she fits into the timeline of of those, you know, that mama and little ones. We don't know. Right, right. Yep, so there you have it. So I don't think I said this before, but he was known as the chameleon killer. The chameleon because, uh, killer. He changed his stripes so many times. Well, and he was kind of known as that. I mean, what, after he was in prison and they figured out he was a serial killer? <laughs> like, yeah. Man, too little too late on this guy. Yeah, very, very much. I mean, he's a, the poster child for why we need to have very good, uh, you know, sharing between agencies and over state lines and, you know, yeah. very solid databases. Mm -hmm. He's wide. another Israel Keys. Yeah. Just traveling all over, you know, so many of them did that and it doesn't work for them as well now as it used to. Yeah. Because so much of like law enforcement collaboration has come out of serial killer cases. Yeah. Like yeah. Uh, the Golden State uh, Killer, you know, that was yeah. a huge one mm -hmm. um, just within the state of the state of California because city and county um, yeah. jurisdictions were talking to each other. But lots of these cases have brought to light how important it is that you know we have national databases and states and yeah. you know that everybody communicates for this very reason 
absolutely. Yep. All righty. Well, that's it. So if your head's not spinning, you probably haven't made it all the way through this. <laughs> <laughs> right. Boy, that is confusing. But I got to say, that dude was a pro at picking really innocuous white guy names. Mm -hmm. I have no doubt that was super intentional. Vulnerable young mamas that wanted somebody to care about yeah. them. Yes. Yep. So much so. Oh, gosh. Yep. So lucky. Well, that's it. So this is our Wednesday episode. So we'll actually be back tonight at 7 p.m., for case updates and then yep. we'll be back tomorrow night thursday night at 7 p.m mountain for the psychic hour and then watch this weekend for some pop-ups too for sure a little extra stuff here and there so we want to thank you guys so much for being here this has been another episode of true crime paranormal with psychic sisters take care <laughs> <laughs>